Well, thank you so much for having me here. Um, I probably don't even need a microphone, but it'll probably help the folks in the back of the room and also for the webinar. Um, I'm happy to be here to talk to you guys about um, school bullying. This is an area in the department that we probably get the most frequent amount of phone calls from parents, um, administrators, and everyone in general. Um, and I think that there's a really good correlation between um, school bullying and what occurs in some of your delinquency cases and also students that are getting in trouble that you're seeing in juvenile court. Um, so I want to start with the evolution of the school bully and how did we get to where we are today? So I want to go back in time. Um, and does anybody remember Scott Farkas? I don't have the video clip, but I love the video of him um, chasing in the Christmas story. He's chasing Ralphie's little brother around and chasing Ralphie. And then finally, in the end, you have Ralphie who just pummels him to death. Um, and that was the way it used to be, right? You would have your bullies on the way to school. Um, and the Karate Kid, we had Johnny Lawrence, who was the bully in the Karate Kid. Um, and then Biff Tannen in Back to the Future. Another one, Laura Lizzie, she's from The Craft. I don't know if anybody remembers The Craft. It was one that I liked. Um, and then, of course, we had our Mean Girls. That was like this, in, that was the, um, based on a book, based on Mean Girls. And, and um, wanna, I'm going to show you a clip here. Hold on a minute. I got a couple clips for you because I just find clips to just be add a little something. They're kind of a little fun. It's the end of the day. We'll do a little video watching here. Don't tell my kids because I'm trying to limit their screen time right now. Okay, so the reason that I absolutely love that clip is because it is so true um, in terms of what goes on in high school when it comes to the clicks and the populars and the plastics and the, I mean, it just shows a really good mix. And I can tell you, um, you know, I'm an ALJ and I do a lot of work on cases that involve open enrollment from one district to another district. 
And all of those cases that come before me, they only even get to the State Board of Education if somebody makes a claim that they were bullied and harassed under the bullying and harassment law, and that's why they want to leave the district is because they were bullied and harassed. So I get a lot of fact scenarios that just are so similar to what's going on here where it's, you know, I dated somebody, we didn't like each other, um, or, you know, another girl doesn't like that I dated her boyfriend, or so, um, you know, it's, it's just a really great example of some of the behavior that happens, um, and that leads to kind of the bullying incidents that get worse. Um, so I thought it was just kind of a fun little clip to share with you guys. The other clip here is some other examples of bullying, so you can take your own time to look at that. Um, but, you know, nowadays what we're looking at is we're dealing with, you know, social media. We're dealing with Twitter, Facebook, MySpace, Snapchat. Um, I'm working on a project where we're trying to get um, information out to school districts and to students about the See Something, Say Something campaign. And I've been told time and time again, Snapchat, that's the way to go. Um, that's what students are using. And it's constantly changing, okay? So we're in this constantly evolving arena of new ways of talking and communicating and students are in this new arena of talking and communicating. Um, we have one-to-one -one laptops in schools. We're gearing up all of our schools to be internet savvy and hook them up to the internet even for purposes of taking exams. So um, that's what we're seeing now is, you know, we've seen bullying go from in the classroom to um, the anonymous cyber bullying type arena. So I want to talk about some of the applicable laws. Um, so I know some of you do juvenile work. Uh, so criminal harassment is definitely going to be probably the primary area that you would see if you've got a criminal case that would involve bullying and harassment. It's going to be under the Iowa Code Section 708.7. Um, and some of the things that you'll notice is, um, you know, you'll notice between all of these different laws, there are some common themes with all of them. Um, so I'm going to kind of move forward to kind of the area that I work with most of the time and the area that schools are working with. So anytime that a school has an issue with a student and there's a claim or a complaint of bullying and harassment in general, or it could be cyberbullying, um, there are uh, civil rights laws that might apply um, under the Title IX of the Educational Amendments, um, sex equity, especially if there's sexual harassment or if there's harassment of a transgendered student or um, anything along those lines. There's your civil rights laws if it's based on race or national um, origin. Um, there's also the Rehabilitation Act and Americans with Disabilities Act for disability discrimination. And then you might also be dealing with the Office of Civil Rights Guidelines for career and technical education. So these are all the areas that schools are having to deal with along with, you know, it could be a criminal charge as well. So there may be some criminal charges pending. There may be some issues within the school district where they're dealing with federal civil rights laws. They may also be dealing with the Iowa civil rights laws as well. So there's several different mechanisms that are all going on at the same time or could be going on simultaneously when a school gets a complaint of bullying and harassment. Um, so here's the Iowa civil rights law and then the anti-bullying law for the state of Iowa. So the anti-bullying law was passed in 1997 um, and it's very specific to schools and it actually, um, you know, it, it contains both harassment and bullying and, you know, some of the experts that I work with that are education experts will tell you that sometimes these things are not one in the same, but we've kind of globbed them together in this law because that's how we wrote the law when we wrote it. Um, and harassment and bullying under the law shall be construed to mean any electronic, written, verbal, or physical act or conduct toward a student which is based on any actual or perceived trait or characteristic of the student and which creates an objectively hostile school environment that meets one or more of the following conditions. So a couple of things I want to point out to you in this. It does say electronic. Now in this day and age, we would want to say social media or we would say online or internet, um, but at the department we have always interpreted electronic to, to include that. So we've always told school districts, you know, there, it's not really necessary to go back into the law and specifically change it. The way that we read this, electronic is going to hit all of those arenas. So 
shouldn't be concerned about that. And I know a couple years ago, they've tried to go in and make adjustments to the law to include that. And we've said that's great if you do it for clarification, but we've always said that, you know, social media can also be included um, if it relates back to the school and if it bleeds back into the school. So, and I'll talk a little bit more about that as we go ahead and move forward. Um, the other thing I wanted to point out to you is this is a lot broader. If you notice and if you look back at some of the civil rights laws, this um, hits any trait or characteristic of the student, but it also peels off of our civil rights laws. And when you think about sexual harassment, like in a school or in um, an employment context, they always talk about pervasive harassment in, a, in an employment context. So we've also peeled off of that when it comes to our um, bullying and harassment law in schools. So it also must place the student in reasonable fear of harm to their property. It must have a detrimental effect on their physical or mental health. It must have a substantial interference on academic performance, or it could have, um, an, it could interfere with that student's ability to participate in athletics or other activities. <laughs> So we talked a little bit about electronic, and again, we have always interpreted that to mean cell phones, internet, electronic mail, anything like that. And then I want to talk a little bit about trader characteristic, because in the law, it is really expansive. It includes those areas that are not only covered by your civil rights laws, but it includes physical attributes, um, physical or mental ability or disability, ancestry, political party preference, political belief, socioeconomic status, or familial status. About the only thing that this doesn't cover is, I just don't like you. And at one point in time, we actually had legislation where we were going to be even more expansive to say that any, you know, that I don't like you is going to fall under the category of bullying as well. Um, one of the things that I will tell you is probably the most um, confusing for parents is that when you talk about bullying, they are going to tell you, my kid was picked on on the playground, he was called names, he's being bullied. And they're gonna file a complaint with their school district under, you know, and we'll get into some of the responsibilities of the district here. Um, the district will do an investigation and more than likely the district's gonna come back and say, no, that wasn't bullying under 280.28. And the reason is, is because most of the time, name calling, I won't play with you on the playground, um, ostracizing, that's not gonna fall under the um, legal definition of bullying and harassment under 280.28. It just does not fall under there. It has to be very specific. It has to be to a much higher level. The cases that we have found to be bullying and harassment involve a lot more serious behavior than just name calling. And so we have a lot of cases on our website that talk about students who wanna open and roll out of the district because of bullying and harassment. And oftentimes they're found not to be quote unquote bullied under the law. So um, moving on to cyberbullying, this is, gets a little bit more interesting. And cyberbullying is a subset of bullying and harassment where we use technology to harass or threaten peers or educators. So cyberbullying, it's a lot easier for students, right? Because we can be anonymous. It can be hard to alleviate because it can be hard to track down if you're the school district and you get a complaint. Um, if it happens at home and it's not at school, people don't complain. Um, and one click and it can be all over the internet in an instant. So then you also have Snapchat and other things where they can delete it and they can you know, put it out there for everyone and then it, it falls off in a few days or falls off in a minute, but it's still out there for people to see. So cyberbullying is you know, probably a newer trend. It doesn't mean that you know, good old bullying has gone away because that's still there, but this is just a little bit more of an anonymous way of, of being a bully. So with cyberbullying, um, now, schools and school districts, they can get at cyberbullying if there is a nexus that, that ties that cyberbullying back to the school district. Um, there has to be a close nexus between what happened and the cyberbullying and going back to school. 
So I'll give you a couple of examples of that. You may have um, a situation where a student is, somebody on Facebook puts a derogatory post on Facebook, everybody sees it. The next day, the student goes to school, people are making fun of the student at school, everybody's seen it, everybody's going up to that student, everybody's talking about it, you know, um, and that, that child is really upset, they go and talk to administration. That is a situation where I would say that the district absolutely has a nexus that leads back into the school that would allow them to do something about it, okay? Um, especially if the bully on the other side, if they can identify them as another student. Um, so if there's that nexus back to the school, then the school has a little bit more authority to do something beyond having it go on to a criminal case or some sort of delinquency case. Um, that you might see as a juvenile um, law attorney. So um, there are also some issues that can come into play because of free speech. So we're gonna talk a little bit about some of the free speech um, areas that would have impact this. So we all are aware of Tinker versus Des Moines Independent Community School District. Um, and that case really said that absent either an impingement on the rights of others or the likelihood of a substantial or material disruption at school, school officials may not regulate student speech at school. But now after that case happened, we've moved forward a little bit and we had Bethel School District versus Frazier. And in that case, the court said that lewd, indecent, objectively offensive speech by students may be regulated by school officials. So schools kind of have to balance, right? If there is a situation that occurs, and um, let me give you another example. Um, you had a student who had a Confederate flag and they were flying it, I think it was uh, Des Moines North High School, okay? We're flying a Confederate flag outside of Des Moines North High School. We know, or at least the district knows, and the principal knows that there is a little bit of some racial tension at that school and somebody's outside flying that flag, you know, they have a reason to believe that there's going to be a substantial disruption at that high school, knowing the history, knowing the racial tension, knowing the things that have occurred in their own school. They have a reason to believe that that's going to cause a substantial disruption in the school day or in the school district. That would be under um, Tinker, that would be enough for the district to say, you've got to pull it down. But it's always fact specific. That may not be the case in another school district. So schools have to kind of, you know, ride a tightrope when it comes to when is it free speech and when is it going to cause a substantial disruption. And again, hate speech, obviously that also does not qualify. That's not going to be protected free speech. And then under Morris v. Frederick, uh, school officials may regulate speech that appears to promote illegal or harmful activity. So I wanna go over a couple examples of some cyberbullying cases um, that have been from all over the United States. Uh, here's a fact scenario where a student created a website that used crude and vulgar language in criticizing the school administration. They didn't use school resources. Um, there were links to the school's official homepage and the student got a 10-day suspension for the incident. Um, the student appealed this and um, took it to district court and the district court actually overturned the decision because the principal testified that he suspended the student because he didn't like the content. Um, had he said that the content would have caused a substantial disruption or that it would have caused a disruption in the school, we may have had a different outcome here and the student's suspension may have been upheld. Here's another fact scenario where this student actually created mock obituaries of their friends, calling it the unofficial Kent Lake High homepage. Um, the student was an honor student, no prior history of discipline, um, wrote on his site with a disclaimer, this site is, has no connection to the school, um, but he invited readers to poll on who should die and local media characterized the site as having a hit list. Um, the student eventually removed it, uh, removed the site, and the court actually found in favor of the student. And the reason that the court found in favor of the student is because there, were no, there was no evidence that anybody felt threatened um, or that he, the creator was going to harm anyone um, and no e evidence of disruption. Now that was back in 2000. I sort of wonder if we would have the same reaction today 
um, given the state of guns in schools and, you know, some of the sh mass shootings that we have, would we have had the same reaction that, you know, oh, nobody was, nobody was worried. Um, <laughs> I, I don't know that we would have reacted the same way today. And in this case, the court ruled um, and reversed an expulsion of a student who posted derogatory comments on a personal website about Canadians, lesbians, albinos, florists, and his teachers. Um, the school district actually ended up paying the student $20,000. So you, up to this point, if you're keeping score, the schools haven't won yet. So um, this is like a fine line for school districts, right? And I will tell you that districts around the state, they are gun shy on doing anything to students with social media because they are afraid that they cannot apply that nexus, okay? They're always worried that if it doesn't happen on school grounds, then we just don't have any authority to discipline a student. Um, and again, you know, we have said, we think you do, but you just have to have that nexus back to the school. Okay, so here is a case um, that I think the school actually wins this time. So we're gonna go the other direction a little bit. This is a male student who was a competitive ballroom dancer, was verbally harassed and taunted by peers almost daily. Students posted derogatory comments about him on the internet in a chat room um, accessible from the school library. In response, the school made classroom announcements, contacted parents, suspended students. Um, however, the harassment continued. You know, what's the school to do? They've done what they can. They're suspending students. People are getting in trouble. So the family sues and said, you should have stopped this. The court ruled and dismissed the suit in favor of the school because they showed that they took reasonable steps to get their harassment to stop. So a lot of the things that I tell my educators when I go out and talk to them is whatever you do on a bullying and harassment case, don't do nothing. You, even if you try, even if you can't make the harassment stop, if you make an attempt, if you sit down, if you try to punish the students, if you try to talk to their parents, if you make an attempt to make it stop or to have the behavior stop, you're going to put yourself in a better position and the school in a better position as well um, because you, you've made an attempt to make it stop. Here's another example. This is a middle school student that um, created an icon that depicted his English teacher being shot at home and sent it to 15 other students, who one, of course, showed it to their teacher. Um, the teacher was distressed enough that they stopped teaching. Um, the student was suspended, and it was upheld by the courts because they said it was a it was reasonably foreseeable that that would come to the attention of school authorities and that the teacher um, that there would be a substantial and material disruption of work at the school. So they found that that piece was met in that case. Here is another scenario where a student sent instant messages to classmates from home computer, um, and they found that the instant messages were true threats. He threatened he was going to bring a kill or bring a gun to school and kill certain classmates. The student was suspended and arrested, and the student alleged that his free speech rights were violated. Um, because the instant messages caused a substantial disruption, the suspension was upheld. Okay, so here's an interesting set of facts. Um, there are two cases, Layshock and JS, so I'm going to kind of go through both. And under Layshock, it was a senior with no disciplinary history who was um, academically successful, created a parody website and a profile of his principal on MySpace. It was um, juvenile, vulgar, and crude. He didn't use school time. He didn't do it at school, didn't use school equipment. Um, and the student's off-campus speech did not result in a substantial disruption of operations to the school. Therefore, on this case, they granted summary judgment to the student. So, um, and I'll get into a little bit of why. Does anybody have an idea of why they, the school lost on that one? My, it's a MySpace profile of the principal. No takers, okay. We can, we'll go through the next one and then we'll see if anybody wants to 
chime in. So the next one is JS, and the facts in that case were, as in Layshock, which is the one we just talked about, student created a fake MySpace profile and used a photo of the principal from the district's website. Um, it depicted the principal as a pedophile and a sex addict. Um, in this case, the ruling was that school officials did not violate the student's free speech rights rights by disciplining her and granting the school's motion for summary judgment because they found that Frazier applied. So fast forward to the appeals. Um, there was on April uh, 10th of 2010, the U.S. Court, Court of Appeals for the Third District granted motions for rehearing in bank in both JS and Layshock, and both cases were argued before the court. And the Third Circuit issued a ruling finding in favor of both students. And they said, you can't apply Frazier because of a standard outside of school. There was no substantial disruption. And Tinker was not meant, or met in this case, um, because it wasn't meant to protect a school official, OK? This actually went up to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court denied rehearing, basically ruling in favor of both students and their free speech rights. So apparently, you know, if you are a student and you pick on another student, might be not really be free speech if it causes a disruption, but if we pick on our teachers and administrators and it doesn't really interrupt the school day, that's okay. So beware of those students, if any of you teach. <laughs> Okay, so I want to touch on sexting a little bit. Um, obviously, when we think about cyber um, bullying, sexting, texting, instant messaging, iPhones, you name it. I tell you what, I've got a seven-year-old and a 10-year-old, and my 10-year-old really wants a phone, and for all of these things that I talk about, I don't ever want her to have one, um, other than they have little GPS tracking devices on them, which I find really handy as a parent, because um, then I can track her. <laughs> so sexting includes photos of messages meant to be to harass a recipient, sending photos um, to humiliate, sending obscene materials to minors, um, even if it's consensual. And I tell you what, we have a problem in our schools with sexting. Um, I had one school and um, that had, you know, once one goes out and everybody thinks it's funny, we send it out to the next person, the next person sends it out to the next person, the next person sends it to the next person. And before you know it, I have the whole school involved. And gee, what does that county attorney do with that, right? Like, I, I was a county attorney before. Um, I, I don't know what I would do with that, right? It's bad behavior. Um, it's illegal. We don't want that happening. But it's also a teachable moment probably, um, and a great opportunity to work with the county attorney and the school district to see what we can do. Um, I'll give you a couple examples here. You're probably aware of this case. It's an Iowa high school student, Jorge, um, complied with a request from a minor female friend to send her a picture of his penis. The young lady was not offended by this, and she testified that all my friends are doing this. It's just a joke. Uh, but her mother, who saw the picture, did not find it very funny. So Jorge ended up being convicted of dissemination of obscene material to a minor. He is now on our sex offender registry. Well, he was until June of 2016. So that was really the first case of sexting in Iowa that I recall. Um, I'm not sure if there have been um, very many since then, but I do know from a school aspect, when I get cases of bullying and harassment, um, I've had a, several examples, and we'll actually go through these here. Um, so let me first go over the role of the school when it comes to cyberbullying. So the school under um, Iowa Code 280.28 .28 has to have a policy in place that um, to investigate cases of bullying and harassment. They have to determine if it's an unfounded or a founded incident of bullying and harassment. So if a parent comes in and complains of bullying and harassment um, and they request to file a complaint, they can file a complaint. The school district hires an investigator in some cases. They do an investigation and make a determination of whether it's founded or unfounded. 
At the same time that they're doing this investigation, the school should also be thinking about if there's a violation of Title IX, of the Iowa Civil Rights Act, um, or of any of the other civil rights acts that we have, because if they're not looking at it um, at the same time, they could have the Office of Civil Rights breathing down their neck because of a complaint. And I'll give you a couple examples. I know Cedar Rapids School District has a civil rights complaint that they're dealing with because of race issues. Um, and so that's, that's one example. Um, it, they come up all the time, and the problem is, is if you're not thinking about it in that way, you're going to miss something. So it's got to be, anytime you get a complaint, you, you're going to look at all of those different sets of laws and make sure you're doing what you can under each of them to address it. If it is founded, you may be able to punish for that behavior. So even if it's a cyberbullying case, if you find that the cyberbullying has impacted the school and has a nexus back to the school, it could be a bunch of kids at school that were cyberbullying, um, that's where the district has the authority then to punish that student. So that's when they can suspend, that's when they can expel, um, and let's see. The other thing is, say they don't have a nexus, okay? Say the district does not feel comfortable, we feel like now this is, off school grounds, off, you know, this was a text message that somebody sent to somebody when they were on spring break or over the summer. It happened over the summer, even though it was between two students. They just don't feel like it connects back to the school. Is there anything else they can do? My question for the district is, does your student have a good conduct policy that they've signed? So schools have good conduct policies. If you are in activities, if you are in sports, any of those things, all your students sign good conduct policies and those policies are incredibly broad and they can be because there is no right to play sports in Iowa. You don't have a right to do that. So if you wanna play sports, you sign a good conduct policy and you have to basically abide by those terms. So, if it's unfounded, you can also correct bad behavior by simply picking up the phone, calling the parents and saying, hey, here's what's going on. Can we rectify this situation? It may not be quote unquote bullying under our law, but it's not nice and it's bad behavior. So let's correct it because you know what? The last thing we want is unhappy kids at school, even if it doesn't fit a legal definition of bullying. I frankly hate our legal definition. I will tell you that because um, it puts administrators in a really bad position um, when it comes to these cases and they come back to mom and dad and it's all in how you phrase it too, okay? So if you go back to mom and dad and you say, well, we did this bullying and harassment complaint, we investigated it, and I'm sorry, it doesn't meet the legal definition. You know, I mean, you're not going to make friends with mom and dad because they've already decided it's bullying or they wouldn't have filed a bullying and harassment complaint. A lot of times what I tell administrators is, don't couch it that way. Go back to them and just say, you know what, it wasn't a founded incident, however, this is bad behavior, we're gonna make it stop, here's what we're gonna do, you know, try and attack it that way. So, if it is a crime, if you think it's a crime as an administrator, we also tell you to work law enforcement, file a report, also never discourage the victim from filing a report either. So discipline, I think we've already talked about this. Um, the Iowa legislator has uh, conferred broad authority, <laughs> sorry, it's the end of the day, um, broad authority to local school boards to adapt and enforce its own rules. That is in our section of code. Um, and the board shall make rules for its own government and that of its pupils and the care of the schoolhouse, the grounds, the property of the school corporation, and shall aid in the enforcement of those rules. They have really broad authority to punish their students. Um, they also have explicit statutory authority to expel or suspend students for violating school rules pursuant to Iowa Code 282.4. And with regard to discipline, schools just need to make sure that they are following appropriate due process requirements. So if you've got a suspension that's 10 days or less, um, you still have to have notice, um, but your, your level of due process is a little bit lower than if you're actually expelling the student. You're going to have a lot, a, little, a lot higher due process for a student you're going to expel. Um, and generally, if the state board gets an expulsion or a suspension appeal, which I usually sit in front of those, 
Uh, we will not overturn it unless your decision as a school board or a local school board is completely unreasonable, which is a really hard thing to find. It's hard to find that it was unreasonable that a board expelled a kid or suspended a kid. So due process, notice, opportunity to be heard. And the last thing I think we have is, um, we talked about that too. If it's off school grounds, here are some of the authorities that we have for um, incidents that are off school grounds, the good conduct policy again. Um, and schools, again, under uh, Bunger versus Iowa High School Athletic Association, they may govern out of school conduct um, of its students who participate in extracurricular activities because, quote, these students are looked up to and emulated and they represent the school and depict its character. So even if you have an incident that occurs off school grounds, if that student is under a good conduct policy, you've got a lot of authority to punish them through the athletics and suspending them from the team or doing something like that. Um, so this is Brands v. Sheldon, which is kind of the seminal case for good conduct cases. And in that case, it established that a secondary student has no right to participate in athletics or extracurricular activities. Since there is no right, the amount of due process owed to a student is minimal. And in order for a student to be disciplined under school's good conduct policy, there only needs to be some evidence of a violation. So if you have a student that violates good conduct, it's a very low bar. And the role of law enforcement. So I feel like there's so much that schools can do when it comes to bullying and harassment, because we've kind of just went through all their options, right? And even if it's not on school grounds, they've got some options. If it's not a good conduct policy, they can go to the parents because they have access to the parents and it may come from them a little bit better than it would come from law enforcement or you know, if a student gets charged. So I would encourage you all that if you have students that have these situations where they have a delinquency case or a proceeding because of this, um, is there a way we can go back and work with the school? Is there something we can do? Um, because I think that there's a lot of latitude to do some things um, without necessarily charging students. And I tell you what, I think that it's an opportunity for teachable moments. I mean, they're not all going to be easily taught. And there are going to be some cases, and I've had cases. I had a student who um, was being bullied and harassed so bad that they, at one point, somebody took the lug nut off of her car um, before she got into it and you know they were telling her to get the F out of town and calling her a traitor and um, you know there are definitely situations that are going to lend itself to criminal prosecution and to a delinquency proceeding but then there are cases that may be able to be handled on a, a, a little bit lower level within the district. Um, one of the things that I think is sort of unfortunate is I think um, over time Schools have moved from the school handling things to law enforcement handling things because that's just the nature of the way that things have gone over time. So it used to be that we didn't have school resource officers in school and that's changed quite a bit and you know, rightfully so when you have mass school shootings. Um, but the unfortunate part is then what happens is kids get referred a lot quicker to a resource officer or to law enforcement because they have someone present in the school that does that. Um, and I think that there's a lot that maybe the school can still do with those students that doesn't necessarily need law enforcement involvement. So just something to think about. Um, and I've just, and I can say that my progression through, you know, juvie work and criminal work and, um, you know, it's when, once kids get in that system, it's hard to get them out. So if we can kind of keep them down on a school level and do some things on a school level, um, I think that's a good thing. So the role of um, law enforcement and cyberbullying. Um, so of course, you know, if law enforcement gets a, a complaint, they're going to investigate it. Um, I would encourage them to work with the school officials to investigate the complaint. Um, maybe they can work together. And I know some schools with their school resource officers, they have these agreements um, between the two of them on how they're going to handle things. 
So they can agree that, you know, we have a school resource officer, that school resource officer is going to help us to do something within the school to handle this. Um, and that doesn't necessarily then get referred on to the full um, police force. Um, so it's a, an important agreement to check. So if you've got a student who um, has a school with a resource officer, it might be interesting to check and see what their agreement is with the with law, or um, the local police force in terms of how they're going to handle those cases. Because sometimes they take those cases, handle them internally, the school uses it, does disciplinary action, but the law enforcement officer or the school resource officer does not turn that over then to the actual um, police force. So it's held, handled internally. Um, so interesting to know what kind of agreement your schools have because they do have, if they have a school resource officer, they likely have some sort of interagency agreement with them on how they're going to handle those situations. Are we going to share information back and forth with law enforcement or are we going to keep it in-house? Um, so uh, law enforcement, of course, would determine if there's maybe a chargeable offense and if um, we should begin delinquency proceedings. Um, and to continue to work with the victim. So cyberspace cases. Okay, so these are some of my examples and I'm gonna play this little clip first. If I can get it to work, we'll see. Okay, so unfortunately, that's probably a pretty accurate depiction of somebody who's been in that type of situation. And I actually recently had a situation just like it. Um, the case of the revenge porn. So the facts on this case, um, I've tried to use some movie names for anonymity. Um, Biff, 18, and Lorraine, 15, were dating over the summer of 2017. During that time, the two were intimate. Unbeknownst to Lorraine, Biff recorded her their encounter on his cell phone. The two broke up after school started, and Biff is a member of the school football team. Biff began circulating the video of the encounter to other classmates on his phone, and Lorraine found out. Dr. Brown suspended Biff from the football team for several games. So how does anybody want to take a crack at how this one's going to turn out? I don't know anybody's names. I can't call on you. This is that I'm at a disadvantage today. In the back. Biff is going to get criminally charged because he that, published something that was an underage girl. That's a that I think that's an option. Anybody else agree with that? Any other options? Can you steal the facts of my case. 
<laughs> um, no, but these happen all the time, right? Yeah. But the revenge porn law just came into effect last year. In fact, my daughter, Erin Romar, is the one that really pushed for it. Good. Because she had talked to a lot of the law enforcement agencies. There was no law to protect um, redissemination of the sexting things without the permission of the victim. So that's the new revenge porn law. Yay. So um, anything else that could happen to this student? So we know that we could charge him criminally, probably, right? We think dissemination, maybe harassment on top of it. What else could we do? Mark? I personally don't think the school's done enough. A few suspensions, the kid's still in school, and he's going to get madder than hell that he's been suspended from a football games, and it's going to increase. I think they just increased the amount of harassment and left themselves open to a suit. What could they do? Is it okay that they suspended him from the football team? It's okay they suspended him from the football team, but it didn't go far enough because they didn't get him off the campus, and he's there to continue to take revenge and have all his teammates take revenge too. If any of you were football players, I apologize, but don't have a lot of respect. They're not all bad, I promise, but definitely. Um, so this is an actual case, and um, kind of talk a little bit about the school district's role. So we talked about, um, here are some things that if you're the school district, you should be doing, okay? Um, violation of bullying and harassment policy. So we should be filing a bullying and harassment complaint, you know, once we know about it. And in this instance, the student did go and report it and the principal was aware. Um, and they also should be looking at if there's a Title IX violation because this is sexual harassment as well. Um, also under Iowa Code Section 216.9 also could be sexual harassment um, in education. Okay, um, is there a First Amendment issue? No, not in this one. Um, is there a sufficient nexus to the school? Well, um, you know, again, I would say that you've got a nexus when both students attend the same school, other students are telling the student that, hey, he's disseminating this video of me. You know, even if it's happening off school time, I think you can make enough connections to say, yes, we have some authority. Um, and if, if we find there's authority, then they can investigate, they can issue discipline, they can suspend, they can expel. Um, let's just assume that they didn't find a nexus, okay? What if there was no nexus? What if it all happened over, spring, or, um, over um, summer break? Would that change the scenario for you if we change those facts and say, hey, this all happened over the summer, the school wasn't aware until the school year started, but everything by the time school started it all settled down does anyone want to take a crack at that it would be uh, if if the student is on the good conduct policy right now what if it what if they weren't what if they were not on the good conduct policy then what well we now have our revenge porn statute right so it would be criminal so that may be kind of the the trail that you would see, right? So schools kind of at some points can have their hands tied depending on circumstances. So that's why we get into these factual scenarios where it's like, well, what happens if it happens over the summer and the school isn't in session and, you know, the student isn't coming to school and having the same experience that our little video showed. So it makes a difference um, in how we handle these. It doesn't make it okay, but it gives the district a little bit less authority to do something about it if it's happening over the summer. Um, so obviously the school should notify school resource officer, work with local law enforcement. Um, in this situation, the, the, school, the student did get suspended from the team. Um, local law enforcement was in the process of investigating it. And the student and um, her old boyfriend made up, decided they weren't gonna talk about each other's escapades. Um, all of the harassment subsided and it stopped. Um, so that's, that's factually what happened. Um, but I don't know if the student ever did actually get charged. 
Um, so we talked a little bit about law enforcement's role, that they would want to work with the school to investigate a complaint of harassment. Again, if it happened over the summer, it might be more law enforcement's role than it would be the school's role because of their failure to have an access to what happened. Um, so you would, uh, again, determine whether or not it's going to be the school's role, if they have an authority that they can play or not. Um, you know, this student, since he was a football player, if it happened over the summer and he was, you know, if it was during football season, they might have a little bit more opportunity to, to apply the good conduct policy. Um, and then you'd want to institute a safety plan for the victim. You know, schools are sort of tied to a certain extent in that, you know, um, they have the ability to suspend and expel, but they also have to go through due process for those things. And they can't just, you know, kick the student out without going through those processes. So, um, because they also have the responsibility of educating. So it can be kind of um, hard for them because there are going to be situations where you've got a victim and a perpetrator in the same building and you might not necessarily be able to get rid of one or the other. You know, definitely not the victim, but then what happens when you're not in a good position to do something um, ab about the perpetrator? Okay, so this is the case of the Burning Cross. Johnny and three other members of the high school karate team were photographed wearing white hoods, brandishing a Confederate flag, a rifle, and standing in front of a burning cross. The image spread like wildfire across social media, and a minority member of the karate team was offended by the post. The school and law enforcement were contacted. The students were suspended from karate by Mr. Miyagi for the remainder of the school year. All right, so who thinks there's a First Amendment issue in this case scenario? Anybody think that we have a First Amendment problem? Well, I will tell you, and you may all be aware of this case because it was my friend who happened to be in Thailand when this happened this last year, said that he saw it on the news in Thailand. It was big news, and this actually happened in Iowa. Um, and it was interesting because as I was watching this unfold on the news and in the paper, there were some people who were commenting and saying, oh, this could be a First Amendment violation, they were off school grounds, it was not on school time, you know. Um, and so there were several professors that were saying, oh, First Amendment could be a violation, you know, you can't do that. And I'm thinking to myself, man, you have not heard about the good conduct policy. Um, because the good conduct policy would put the school in a great position to suspend all those kids off of that karate team or the football team, as it may be. And, um, and, you know, students, again, they have no right to play sports. So there's very little that the school would have to show or do. All they have to show is that those students were not being good pillars and, and a good example for the school. And they're going to be on good ground if somebody tries to challenge them being kicked off the team. Now, suspension or expulsion um, might be a little bit more difficult. And why is it going to be more difficult? Anybody want to take a crack at that one? Off school grounds, not on school time, on the internet. So the question, what's the question going to be? What are we going to look for if we want to try and suspend or expel the students in disciplinary action? At the end of the day, I know. Get, just. Disruption, yep, substantial disruption. Is there a substantial disruption to the school district? Did it bleed back into the school when it happened? I'm almost positive it did. Um, you know, it bled all over the news, all the way over to Thailand. I can't imagine that it didn't bleed into the school, but um, nonetheless. So, school district's role, investigate for a violation of bullying and harassment, um, civil rights laws, no First Amendment issue. Was there a nexus? Could be, depending on the circumstances. We don't know all the facts. Um, and if there's no nexus, then they can punish for um, good conduct policy. And then law enforcement role. Work with the school. Um, obviously, determine who is in a better position to handle it. And, you know, can the students be charged with the crime? Was there a hate crime here? Probably not, unless it was directed at one, one person. 
Um, unless there was something, you know, specific, I, I don't know. Um, I haven't looked at the hate crime statute in a while, so I'm kind of at a loss on that one. Um, could it be harassment, depending on how it occurred? So I think you would want more facts to understand whether or not it would fall into that category um, and whether or not there was a specific victim in mind. Okay, so here's my last fact scenario. It's school sexting. Several students at North Shore High School received inappropriate text messages from Regina George that showed her naked. Rather than report it, the students forwarded the text to other students, including Erin Samuels, who was dating Regina. Erin reported it to Mrs. Norberry. However, by this time, the photos had been sent and received all over the school, and other students were sharing similar pictures of themselves. So let's look at our school's responsibilities. So they have to investigate for bullying and harassment or some sort of violation of civil rights laws. Do we have a violation when Regina sent it out? Maybe not, maybe, I think it depends. Um, if it's going out around the school and girls are sharing theirs and we're starting to get into, you know, um, could be sexual harassment depending on if the people who are receiving it are wanted or unwanted. Um, let's see what else. I'm thinking off the top of my head. Um, First Amendment issue, probably not. Okay, so this is another actual case that I've had, just so you know. So these are the things that are happening in our Iowa high schools, which is somewhat fearful. And, you know, this is the perfect situation of a case where if everybody starts sending that dissemination of obscene material, then do we charge everyone? Okay, so you got one person that sends it out. That's bad enough, right? You know, we want to charge the person who started the, charged it, or who started it, but what happens when everybody sends it out and then other people join in? And we've actually had this happen, so what do we do? You know, unfortunately, so this is one of those things where I say, you know, kids are young, they do stupid stuff, this is really stupid, um, but they probably think, well, they wanted to see it and it was harmless and I sent it and it was no big deal, it was just my boobs and who cares? Um, you know, I mean, we're stupid young girl, Regina George, um, and she thinks it's harmless until five years later when she's applying to get into college and it pops up on a post, you know. So this is a really great opportunity to have a teachable moment with that school district, okay? And the school is in an awesome position to do that. They can work with the county attorney's office, you know, and I know in this situation, the county attorney's office didn't really want to charge everybody who was disseminating because that's just not going to work. Um, so we don't charge everyone, but what we do is we work with them and the school can bring somebody in to talk to those kids about the importance of not sexting, internet stuff, whatnot. They have the capacity to get all those kids together all at one time to train them on appropriate use of cell phones and media. So great opportunity to think outside the box and say, hey, we really need to do something because clearly this is a problem and we don't want everybody walking out of here with some charge on their juvie record for dissemination of obscene material. Um, so I think that was my last example. Here's some resources at our websites. That's the Office of Civil Rights um, for the um, US DOJ. There is um, some information on equity education on our website as well that has information as well. And my contact information, does anybody have any questions? So you had, you know, mentioned, uh, can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Uh, you had mentioned, you know, hate speech is not free speech. Is there a definition? Is there case law um, that, that gives a definition of hate speech? Is it the same as the objectively offensive speech before? Because there's some things, you know, it was derogatory statements, you know, in one of those cases that was vulgar uh, <coughs> statements in another one, you know, what, what is the definition we're working here? 
Okay, so there is case law out there, and I, I so I don't want to like misquote, but there is case law out there that talks about hate speech versus non-hate speech. So, um, you know, you can't be directly offensive to someone, and you know, um, based on, I'm trying to think of examples. Like, if I think there was a case actually that they were looking at charging based on hate statutes, was that there was an individual I can't remember where in Iowa it was, but there was a student that. Um, was actually killed and murdered because he was a transgender student um, and an individual killed him because he found out um, in the process of, I think, having an intimate moment that he was transgendered and killed that individual. Now, if it would have been a situation where you had a transgendered individual and you were personally attacking them and, um, you know, you fag, I hate you, if it was, I mean, there are some language there are some um, very specific things that you could say, I think that would fall under the category of hate speech when you're being hateful and you're doing, you know, racist remarks or remarks against, you know, a transgendered student or a female or, I mean, I think there are things that will come into that realm that won't necessarily be, it'll cross over into the path of hate speech as opposed to, Free speech, I can say what I want. I believe in, you know, if you, um, for example, the cross burning, you know, I can burn a cross, I can do what I want, but, you know, when you deflect it at a specific person, I think there are a lot of factors that come into play with that, and I don't, I, I apologize, I don't have a de definition of hate speech. Okay. I could probably pull it up for you, there um, the but one, there is a difference. There was the one principal who was called a pedophile, you know, on the, Facebook page or something like that. Yeah, but you know, those principles, they're supposed to have thicker skin, kind of like law enforcement, right? Like we talk about law enforcement having thicker skin and you can call law enforcement a fag or whatever you want and that shouldn't be enough for law enforcement to pull you over. I think it's a little bit akin to that. At what point can you say with the school principal that it, that it was something directed at him that was going to disrupt the school day or whether or not it was just something he didn't like? I think that was the difference in that case. They talked about how he didn't like the content. He wasn't fearful. He wasn't worried about it disrupting the school day. He just didn't like it. And because he was the administrator, they said, eh, he's the administrator. You know, we're less concerned about you. Um, and again, the case law has been a little bit mixed between student and administrator. And I'll look, I'm going to, I know there's a definition of hate speech. I should put it in here, and I didn't, and I'm sorry for that. I don't want to cut Nicole off, but we do have ethics as our last hour. So I'm Oh, you got to sure get your ethics in. We get Tara in here. So <laughs> Thank please. you very much.